We're now just weeks away from a nova that you can see with your eyes. NASA is looking for new Mars sample return mission ideas. There's frost on Olympus Mons and watching asteroids collide in another star system. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. I'm sure you've noticed the increasing drumbeat of news about the upcoming Nova that's going to be appearing in T Corona Borealis. And I'm here to confirm that this thing that you've been hearing is true. It's real. Yes, a star is going to brighten by a factor of 1,500 times. It's going to go from essentially invisible, unless you've got a powerful telescope, to something that you can see with the unaided eye. You'll be able to go outside, look into the sky, and you will see a new star where it wasn't there before. That all sounds amazing. Okay, so first, I want to explain what's going on, and then I want to sort of help you maximize your chances of actually seeing it. So first, what's going on? Well, T Corona Borealis, this is an actually a binary star system where you've got a white dwarf star that is consuming material from a companion star. It is stripping away this material and it is piling up on the outside of the white dwarf. And as this material piles up, it heats up and eventually every 80 years, it detonates in a thermonuclear explosion off the surface of the white dwarf star. And then the process starts all over again. And because astronomers have recorded multiple instances of this happening, they know that when it's expected to happen again, and that time works out to be sometime summer 2024. And that's like now. So probably sometime between August, September, we should see this brightening of this star. But I need to manage your expectations because this star is going to become from essentially invisible to the brightness of a normal star, not an extremely bright star. It's going to be about as bright as Polaris. So if you know how to find the North Star, and you know how bright Polaris is, that's how bright this star is going to be. So what I'd like to do instead is teach you how to prepare for it to find it and be ready. And the way you do that is you need to find two constellations in the sky and become very familiar with them. And also then you can find the third constellation where this is going to happen. So first, one of the brightest stars in the summer sky is Arcturus. And this actually is at the bottom of a constellation called Bootes. Bootes? You always give me a hard time when I pronounce it. And then the other one is Vega, which is part of the summer triangle. And so two of the brightest stars in the sky. And you're going to need to just find it. You need to learn where Arcturus is and you need to learn where Vega is. Because halfway in between those two stars in the sky, is Corona Borealis. And it looks like a semicircle, like a like a bowl that's in the sky. And so go out, find Arcturus, find Vega, find the halfway point, find Corona Borealis, become accustomed to what this constellation looks like. And here's the important part. When the Nova goes off, you're going to see a new star that is outside of this bowl. And that's T Corona Borealis and you will be able to find it. You'll be able to point it out. You'll be able to go outside with your friends and go, you see all those stars over there? No, no, like the one to the right to let me, okay, there, you, you see that other star over there? That's the Nova. And then you'll watch as it fades away over the coming weeks, and you were there, you were present for when it happened. But I, I like, I just, again, I just wanna manage your expectations. There's not gonna be this enormously bright supernova that's gonna blaze away. You have to know what you're looking for to see it. But when you do see it, then you know that what you're watching is a white dwarf star that has an explosion on its surface because it is feeding from a companion star. And I hope that your imagination matched with what you're actually seeing with your own eyes will make this feel like a memorable moment for you. NASA is looking for new ideas for the Mars sample return mission. Now, NASA's Perseverance rover is working hard on Mars right now, drilling various samples from rocks and then putting them into sample tubes and then putting them inside its body carefully to gather these up for eventually they can be returned from the red planet. And this was all part of the plan. And so NASA sent Perseverance to collect the samples. And then the plan was that they would do a partnership with the European Space Agency to send a spacecraft to Mars to land near Perseverance, collect the samples off of Perseverance, maybe chase down other samples that Perseverance has just been dropping on the landscape put them into to an ascent vehicle, bring it up to space, it would dock with another vehicle, and then that would return home and re enter the Earth's atmosphere. And then 
scientists on Earth would have access to those incredible samples from Mars, but that he could analyze them in the world's greatest labs. But it was clear that there was a problem. It was cost delays, time delays, and so NASA put together an independent panel to find out, you know, what's the problem here? And they came back and said, okay, this is gonna cost more than $11 billion, and we probably won't get the samples back until after 2040. And NASA decided that's not acceptable. Are there any other ideas? And so back in April, they reached out to the aerospace community and said, give us your proposals. If anybody's got good proposals, we'll award contracts to be able to investigate them further. And so this week we got an announcement from NASA that they've awarded 10 studies. And there are a bunch of very sort of familiar names here. SpaceX is proposing that they use Starship to collect the samples from Mars. Blue Origin is maybe gonna try to retask their existing lander concept to be able to go to Mars. And then you've got Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin, and then some other companies that maybe you haven't heard of, like Quantum Space and Whitting Hill Aerospace. And we don't really have a lot of details. We know that each one of these companies has received $1.5 million. They've got 90 days to deliver a plan. And then from there, NASA will think about what is the best way to carry out the Mars sample return mission. So hopefully someone is going to come up with some really clever idea that brings the cost down, that brings the timelines down, and maybe we will see the samples back from Mars before the 2040s. Chandra confirms the habitability of exoplanets. So all stars have habitable zones. This is a place where liquid water can exist on the surface of a planet, from an M dwarf star, like a red dwarf star, to some of the most giant hottest stars. There are even habitable zones around blue supergiants. It's just you gotta be really far away from the star. But the stars are different. Some stars are putting out different frequencies of radiation. And the concern is that even though you might have a planet that's in the habitable zone around a star, it's going to be receiving really high energy radiation, too much ultraviolet radiation, too much gamma ray radiation, x-ray radiation. So astronomers wanted to double check the kind of radiation output that is coming from a bunch of stars. So they used the Chandra X-ray Observatory and the XMM Newton X-ray Observatory and they analyzed a whole bunch of stars and looked for not just what is the brightness, the luminosity of the star, but what wavelengths are coming out of that star and then cross check that against what would be the habitable zone of that star to find out, you know, before we start looking too hard for habitable worlds around sun-like stars, let's rule out the ones that are clearly being bathed in too much radiation. And they were able to find examples of stars that are giving out roughly the same kinds of wavelengths of radiation as the sun does. So that might be another way to filter when you're looking for habitable worlds. Also, someone should really save Chandra. This, this is an important telescope. More rogue planets seen by Euclid. We've been hearing a lot of news about rogue planets, free floating planets. And one of the biggest discoveries that came was from the James Webb Space Telescope, which was observing the Orion Nebula. And they were doing follow on observations, what had been done with the Hubble Space Telescope, where they were finding these essentially rogue planets, free floating planets drifting around in the Orion Nebula. Hubble found a lot, Webb found way more. They found hundreds, like 700 of these free floating planets, including a bunch that are in binary pairs. Well, now this is a thing to search for. And so the European Space Agency's Euclid Space Telescope has also gone searching for rogue planets in the Orion Nebula. And it has also found new rogue planets that had never been seen before. And I mean, this isn't Euclid's main job. It has a visible instrument, it has an infrared instrument, and but really its job is to map the large scale structure of the universe, try to help figure out dark energy, dark matter, but that infrared instrument is perfect for being able to peer through the dust in a place like the Orion Nebula. So more evidence that these rogue planets are out there. Frost on Olympus Mons. If you have a small telescope and you look at Mars, you can see the polar ice caps. There's a cap at the North Pole and a cap at the South Pole. And during the winter time, during the long, cold, dark winter, then what you're looking at is carbon dioxide, which is this thin sheet that goes above the pole. And then underneath that is a fairly thick sheet of water ice. And then as the summer approaches, all of that carbon dioxide sublimates away into the atmosphere and you're left with just the water ice polar ice cap. 
But the expectation is that you'd only get that water ice forming near the poles where you can have these really cold temperatures. And as you get closer and closer to the equator, you're not going to get that water ice mixed in with the regolith or on the surface or anything. But now astronomers have observed that there is frost forming at the tops of the tallest mountains on Mars, which also happen to be the tallest mountains in the solar system. These are the giant shield volcanoes. Olympus Mons is the most famous of these. And so what you've got is you've got these cracks, the caldera at the top of Olympus Mons, places where shadows are coming in. And so frost forms just after sunrise on Mars. And then within a few hours, it evaporates away and goes back into the atmosphere. The discovery was made using the European Space Agency's trace gas orbiter. And then they were able to confirm it with the Mars Express mission. And it's an incredibly thin layer, probably no thicker than the human hair. And yet it's actually a lot of water, probably 150,000 tons of water are cycling from the atmosphere to the surface and back again every single day. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the most interesting story of the week and the winner by a landslide, possibly the biggest landslide we've ever had was the successful launch and water landings of starships after its fourth flight. So thank you everybody who voted. Now we post the vote to our channel into the community tab within about 24 hours of when we release Space Bites. So if you want to participate in that, go ahead and uh, you'll be scrolling on your phone. You'll see the vote show up. Take a second, give us a vote, and that'll tell us what you're interested in. Now the best chance to see that vote is to subscribe to the channel, to click on the notifications bell, to watch a bunch of our videos, to let the algorithm know that you love our content. A free lunch for satellites. When you have satellites orbiting the Earth, there is this constant drag from the atmosphere on them that causes them to lower their orbit more and more. And eventually, if you don't do anything about it, they will burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. This is why they have to reboost the altitude of the International Space Station. You can make this a lot more efficient using an ion engine. And in fact, this is what the Starlink satellites do. They have Krypton ion engines where they've got tiny tanks of Krypton that they accelerate using an electric field that provides thrust. You don't have to send a lot of these out there. It's very efficient. So you use solar power from the sun to create electricity to accelerate the ions at the back of the spacecraft. But it is still propellant that you have to carry. And when you run out of propellant, then the spacecraft has to crash back into the atmosphere. But researchers have been working on another idea, which is an air breathing ion engine. And so what this would do is that it would fly so low into the Earth's atmosphere that it would start to experience drag from the atmosphere, but then it would be accumulating these particles of the air, it would be ionizing them, and then it would be accelerating them out the back of the spacecraft as a propulsion system. And if you get the balance just right, you can fly a satellite at a very low altitude, and yet it's not going to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. And there are a lot of really interesting reasons why you would want to do this. I mean, you could have climate monitoring, Earth observation, communication systems that are dramatically lower than other high altitude satellites. And as weird as it sounds, you know, we're worried about light pollution. The lower the satellite is, the less of a light pollution it will cause because it will be in the Earth's shadow more quickly when you go into nighttime. So there's a lot of really good reasons why this technology should be adopted. I've been trying to interview somebody who's working on air breathing ion engines for months now. I think I've asked like five or six people. I finally got somebody who was willing to talk with me on the record. So in the next couple of weeks, you should see an interview about this exact technology. Asteroid collisions in another star system. We're now in the age of watching planets form in other star systems. I mean, there have been incredible images of protoplanetary disks from ALMA. We've seen images from James Webb and other space telescopes. But these are all just snapshots, these moments in time where you're seeing a process that takes millions and millions of years. But we know that in that time, It's mayhem. I mean, look at the far side of the moon and all of the craters. A lot of those craters formed during a period when in fact the solar system was extremely young. And so we know that these kinds of collisions and things were happening. And now it turns out astronomers have detected colliding asteroids in a star system that's about 63 light years away. 
system is called Beta Pictoris, and it's well known as a very young protoplanetary system. And in fact, astronomers had first been observing this system using the Spitzer Space Telescope, and they detected large amounts of dust in the system. They just assumed that this dust was the constant grinding of rocks in the system that would just produce all of this excess dust. Well, now James Webb has come along, done its own observations of the Beta Pictoris system and found that a lot of that dust is gone. And so it turns out it wasn't just this constant replenishment of dust, but actually asteroids had crashed into each other, created a bunch of dust, and now that dust has been cleared out by the radiation coming from the star. What's going on with Starliner? Last week in that giant crop of news that we delivered, we mentioned that the Boeing Starliner had arrived at the International Space Station. And I've just got to say like how awesome it was to see SUNY Williams like literally dancing as she came out of the spacecraft into the station. It was a really cool clip that I that I wish I'd noticed before. And the worry before the launch was that there were these helium leaks on the service module of the Starliner and the worry came true. And now we know that there are five leaks on the service module. These are used to help pressurize the propellant on board the spacecraft. And in addition, there were three of its thrusters failed as it was attempting to make its dock with the International Space Station. So what comes next? You've got the astronauts on the station, but they need to come home in this capsule. So NASA has pushed back the return to Earth from June 14th to June 18th. That's going to give them more time to work with Boeing to figure out what are the risks of being able to come back to Earth. And according to NASA, the service module can supply helium for about 70 hours of time. Like right now, everything is shut down. But if they do have to turn everything on, they've got about 70 hours. And that's plenty of time to make a reentry back into the Earth's atmosphere. So right now, we don't know. Maybe this time next week, it'll be a week it's exactly. Yeah, yeah, ne ne next week, I'll tell you what happened. Now you're watching Space Bites, which is our summary of a lot of the big interesting news stories that happened this week. But this is just a fraction of all of the news that we are covering over on Universe Today, which is our website. And I write a weekly email newsletter that gives you everything in one gigantic email like it'll often contain between 20 to 40 stories about space and astronomy as well as a bunch of other links to stories that I found interesting. Now I write every single word in the newsletter. It's completely free. There's no advertisements. So just go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to subscribe. Now I want to talk about building a telescope on the moon. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Andrew M. Gross, David Giltonen, David Matz, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Modso, Paul Rohrbach, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fowler Munley, and Vlad Chiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. I did a really interesting interview this week that I want you to know about and maybe watch if you maybe skipped it. And this is the idea of putting a telescope on the moon. For the longest time, I've been ambivalent about the idea of putting a telescope on the moon. Like why not just put a telescope in space and you can look in all directions as opposed to being on the moon. But it turns out there are a lot of really interesting scientific reasons why you could put a telescope on the moon. On the far side of the moon, you're blocked by all of the electromagnetic leaking from the Earth. And we could see a time in the universe that there's no other way to do it called the Dark Ages in between the cosmic microwave background and the kind of time that the James Webb Space Telescope is looking at. We could observe exoplanets by their magnetospheres as they are releasing auroras into space. We would first detect the planet when we saw that it had a magnetosphere, which is really cool. But also the moon could be used for gravitational wave observatories. You could surround the entire moon in gravitational wave observatories, and then you would have an observatory the size of the moon. So you should check out this interview that I did with Dr. Martin Elvis. And we spend about an hour talking about the different ways that we could use the moon for astronomy and the plans that are in the works to actually make this a reality. So if you haven't already, check out this interview.